does it worry you that like 80 percent of athletes go broke no nah, not really it's a whole new world out there yeah. like 100 million is getting thrown out like and you're at your peak right now so you're good time now everybody's getting 100 million dollars every single team that you get traded to yeah. is better after you get there mm. like this is like this is not an opinion like this is math Welcome back to the Digital Social Hour, guys. I'm your host, Sean Kelly. Here are my co-host, Charlie Cavalier, and our guest today, Spencer Dinwiddie. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. First NBA player oh, on the pod. It's an honor. Yeah. What you been up to out here? You know, I mean, typical summer league stuff. Uh, you know, watching a couple games, attending a couple practices, having some meetings, talking to the young guys, um, maybe a little blackjack. But okay. Nothing too crazy. That's your nice. game? Yeah, that's it. Oh, man. Gambling out here is always... Always a miss from, you know, whenever I play. <laughs> Why blackjack? Uh, it's just the one I understand the most. Gotcha. I have the highest probability. Yep. Started playing it with my uh, college coach, actually. Okay. Do you know how to count? No. No on camera, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Casino's watching this. That's a no. No, I don't think they're going to blacklist you even if you are counting the cards. Hey, man, so yeah, I'm fine. not here often enough. I come here maybe once, twice max a year. So. Yeah. Nice. So you've been getting traded around a lot lately, man. How's that life been like getting uh, traded every couple of years? A lot of upheaval. Um, you spend a lot of time in hotels, not just on the away games. Obviously, you stay there for home games too. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been fortunate. A, a couple of the stops have been uh, a blessing. Dallas uh, and, and Brooklyn, obviously, are mm. two places I love. So, you know, it's been a blessing to kind of spend time in, in both those areas. Nice. One you, of oh, sorry. No, one of on. my favorite things I looked up was every single team that you get traded to yeah. is better after you get there. Mm. Like. This is like this is not an opinion. Like this is math. Thank wow. You. Like every, you add wins to every single team you have ever joined, and as soon as you leave, you know what happens. <laughs> hey man. I, <laughs> uh, hey, if the stats back it the up, stats back I, it up. Hey, it, it, it's, it, yep. That's that's an honor too. I mean, I, I played a game to win. You know what I'm saying? I don't play for you know stats and accolades and things like that. So yeah, you know if the proof's in the pudding, then it means I'm doing my job. So I'm happy about that. That's dope. Would you say a lot of players play to win, or is there some that play for money? Uh, I mean, let, in terms of the money aspect, obviously it's it's a balance, right? Like we we're we're grown men that feed families, you know right. what I mean? So there there is a piece of that to it. Um, in terms of like stat padding specifically or playing to win, I'd say the majority of NBA players I think play to win. Okay. You know I mean, obviously some people do have their different mentalities, and you know, obviously I haven't played with every single person in the NBA, but I would say yeah. the majority have uh, their intentions in, in the right place for the most part. Oh, that's cool. Because the money's so good, you never know, you know. Right. Yeah. No. I mean, again, like I said, we're 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 growing and <laughs> to feed our families. Like we we do want to get paid. Like I'm not gonna sit here and be like, oh, like, you know, I would I would dedicate all this time to it if I was getting paid a penny. It just I couldn't do it. Right. I'd yeah. have to have a normal job as well. But you know, given given the most of the players that I know, like they're 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 out there really competing. That's cool. And you did have to compete from the jump. I mean. Yeah. First, I want to ask one funny question before we get into all the grind you had to do. What do you think Jordan Farmar is upset that he's now the second best point guard to ever come out of your high school? Because <laughs> uh, you're yeah. obviously the best. Yeah, probably. I mean, you know, you had a better <laughs> high school uh, career though. He was McDonald's All American, and so he he wore that title for a very long time. Won a ring with the Lakers. So you know, shout out Jordan Farmar. But, oh, great uh, player. I'm a Kings fan, yeah. so I don't really like the Lakers oh, stuff. Uh, but, I understand. Know. But yeah. uh, no, in, in general though, yeah, NBA career is not. And you averaged more points in the NBA yeah. than you did in high school yeah. and college. Wow. How is that even possible? Yeah. To be honest, uh, my high school team was stacked. Okay. So we had a bunch of great players. I mean, my junior, we had Bryce Zane Jones, uh, who actually UNLV, and then played for the Pelicans for a second. DeAndre Daniels, who got drafted. My senior year, we had a bunch of D1 guys as well. Um, so we were, we were stacked. So I passed the ball a lot in, in high school. Um, I think I went to Hoop Hall and had like, two points and 15 assists like, yeah <laughs> so and then um in the in, in college it's harder to score than it is in NBA. really yeah like the the paint is so packed like mm -hmm. in, in the nba like it, it's so spread out there's no defense in three seconds so really it's one-on-one -on -one. and then, okay. like that was something that i've drilled since i was a kid and i played all the time you know my uncle used to have us playing one-on-one -on -one, like all the time mm. that was like one of the main pieces of our workouts when we were like you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. Wow. Shout out to our sponsor today, AG1. Man, AG1's been a great product. Been using it for the past few months now. Used to have some constipation issues. It's helped my body feel a lot better. 
every morning I wake up and it's a good start to the day, you know? Yeah, same thing with me. I take AG1 in the mornings and at night before I go to bed, especially before working out, bro. It gives me all the nutrition that I actually need. I feel really, really good working out clarity, energized. I mean, it just helps and then it supports my immune system also. Yeah, it's got 75 high quality vitamins. It's got probiotics and honestly, it's pretty affordable. Less than $3 a day to wow, use it. Wow, less than $3 a day? Yeah. I actually like it way better than taking individual vitamins just because, granted, I mean, who wants to take 20 pills? Rather just pour this in my water, shake it up, drink it, and get on the go. Yeah, I used to take like 40 pills a day, but this makes it easy. <laughs> yeah, 40, that's <laughs> a lot, bro. Yeah, so guys, if you're looking for a simpler, more effective investment for your health, try AG1 and get five free AG1 travel packs and a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com dsh drinkag1.com slash dsh link will be in the bio thanks Peace. guys so you'd attribute your success to playing one-on-one -on -one a lot oh yeah for sure especially in the nba game because it, it's two primary actions it's either pick and rolls or, or some level of isolation right yeah and you got drafted in 2014 did you know you were going to get drafted yeah, yeah yeah i did so uh you know coming out of colorado in my, my junior year um, originally, I was supposed to be like in the lottery conversation, lottery pick, or whatever. I tore my ACL, mm. um, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, they told me at the time, obviously, that I probably slipped to the second round. I still declared. So I fully expected to get drafted. It was just a roll of the dice as to what pick, which team. Like, I had, I think by the time I actually declared, I had a draft range of like 20 to 50, which is wow. super high. Like, yeah. they're super, sorry, broad, right? Broad, yeah. Um, whereas most guys might have like, 10 to 20, 17 to 22. Mm. Like, it's like five to 10 picks match. I had a 30 pick match. <laughs> yeah, I'd be <laughs> anxious about that, yeah. not knowing where you're going. It yeah. has to be hard, especially because, I mean, you came back from that ACL injury. What was that like? Just, you know, you your, your entire career is in front of you, right? Yeah. Everything looks bright. Everything's amazing. And then, yeah, I mean, I, I, I tore my MCL, but I think ACLs and Achilles uh, are probably two of the worst things yeah. you can do. Yeah, I would Fox. say probably Achilles one, ACL two, yep. more than wow. likely. Um, yeah, no, I mean, at, at that stage, that ACL, it was uh, it was scary, you know what I mean? Because, like you said, I had my whole career in front of me. I'd finally gotten to a place after not being the most highly recruited guy um, coming out of high school that I was pretty touted, you know what I mean? And I thought, okay, lottery pick, getting ready to start my NBA career. And um, what you don't know about the NBA is kind of like where you start can, can really affect what happens next, right? Like, if you are a lottery picker, top 10 or whatever it is, you know, you, you get the benefit of the doubt. You get that initial shot. You, you get a chance to make mistakes. Right. When you're a second round pick, you know, it's just it just comes down to investment, right? Like they only got it at, at the time. I think my starting salary was like 500,000. Mm. You know what I mean? Like that's far cry from two, three million starting salary just in terms of my investment into you as a player. Mm. And so uh, you don't give me a chance to make mistakes. You got to kind of really be perfect. And, and that's honestly uh, in, in part why it, it didn't really work out to start. Yeah, a lot of players have that one injury and they're never the same. Yeah. What was it like fighting for minutes your rookie season? Yeah, I mean, it was tough. So, uh, like you said, I got drafted in 2014 to Detroit Pistons. Um, we had a veteran laden team. We had a, a veteran uh, biased coach. Like, he, he liked the, the experience and, you know, how, how uh, they, they kind of just knew the game better. And yeah. obviously, at the time, I was, what, 20 years old or something like that. Um, and so the, the older guys, they just they just know better. Like, you know, me now at 30, like I can look back and be like, yeah, like, you know, some of the things that are just kind of seamless and just ring off in my head now, like I wasn't doing it 20. Now, mm. still had the talent, still had, a you know, the potential to produce, but it was going to take time. And, you know, it wasn't something that I was afforded at, at, at that uh, specific stop in my career. Interesting. I uh, I read that you spent a little time in Grand Rapids yeah. when you first got drafted, yeah. and that there was a Steve Blake shooting slump <laughs> that led to them going, you know, hitting you up. Yeah. You got a few starts, and your first game out, I think you dropped like 15 points, yeah. eight assists, something like that, yeah. on the Bulls, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. And then from then on, you were in and out of the rotation for the yeah. year. And then by that second year, it seemed like you were pretty locked in, like you weren't going anywhere, even by the end of that first year. Like, there was never going to be a G League for you ever again after that. Mm. Uh, so, actually, that, that's the crazy part. So, you know, that that did happen. And then um, going to my second year, it, it kind of flipped back. So, you're you're referring to my, my third year, but that's uh, when I got to Brooklyn. So, I ended up having to get cut and Bulls and uh, a whole bunch of stuff. Mm. Um, and I'm Chicago Bulls, not Bulls. Right. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, um, but, but, yeah, no. So, it, it was my third year, actually, where I got really locked in. But... 
Yeah, it was a little bit of a carousel. I spent time in Grand Rapids. Uh, and, yeah, sometimes it, it takes, you know, a, a shooting slump or, you know, an injury or whatever to get your opportunity. And, you know, that's kind of been what got my foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And then I think uh, my work ethic and consistency have allowed me to kind of stay um, in the rotation. And, and yeah. In there. What was it like in the G League? Is it a different game over there or is it similar to the NBA? Completely different. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I tell people all the time, like, each level of basketball is almost like a uh, a different style of dance. Mm. Like, you could uh, dance ballet, ballet really well, but not dance salsa. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and so each level, high school, college, uh, you know, D League, uh, G League, sorry, um, you know, overseas, NBA, they're all the, – the style is different. Mm. You know what I mean? Obviously, D-League is similar just because of the rules, you know what I'm saying, obviously. But the the players are smaller. Um, I'd say the game is probably a little bit more physical just in terms of people fighting for their lives quite literally. Right. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just a little bit different. Yeah, because they're fighting for a roster spot, so it's oh, yeah. a lot of emotions. Yeah, the, the, the hunger is a little bit different down there for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. So we're seeing a lot of these like little viral questions going around. Like, mm -hmm. could an average person you know, run for one yard in an NFL game if given <sighs> 10 carries? Could an average person score a point in an NBA game if they played all 48 minutes? Could my unathletic <laughs> score two points in an NBA game <laughs> if everyone's going full everything? Assuming that my stamina can make it 48 minutes. Yeah, I was going to say, that that's tough. Like, you have to <laughs> check your stamina first. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously, the thing about two points are like one yard. Miracles so, happen. Yeah, it's so many variables, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you could get fouled while they're in the bonus and just knock down two free throws. Right. But Do I trust you to get a bucket? No. <laughs> like, and it's the same thing, like, you know, if – would I trust a normal person to like try to run a go route on a on a on a DB? No, but if if the O line gets a great push, could you fall forward and right. get a yard? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. But if 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 a better question would be like, could you average ten points or average or shoot even average five points? Right. And the answer would be no. Nah, no, no, no way, yeah. no chance. What what what's the most you've averaged in a season? Uh, like twenty one. That's impressive. And you yeah. were top twenty in assists last season, right? Yeah. What made you step up that much last season, you think? Honestly, it was the, it was the change back to Brooklyn, mm -hmm. I think, uh, for the most part. You know, in general, like, again, I try to adapt to the team needs, right? So, you know, when you're in Dallas and playing with Luka, a little bit more spot-up shooting. Um, and then, obviously, when he's off the court, there is that playmaking aspect, but you're also thinking a little bit more score. Mm. You know what I mean? So you're, you're trying to uh, pick up the pace a little bit, think score just to kind of give the defense a, a little bit different look, right? Because right. Luka's going to play at his pace. He's going to have post-ups, pick and roll. It's going to be a little bit slower. Mm. And then my task was to try to pick up the speed a little bit. Um, when I went to Brooklyn uh, midseason, you know, it was a group that was thrown together, obviously, um, and trying to figure things out. And mm -hmm. so the task was how best can you kind of, like, keep the group together? Well, of course, and, and stay in the playoff race, right? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, one of the best ways to do that is Make sure everybody eats, everybody gets touches. You know what I'm saying? Then you got to learn where people, you know, like the ball, et cetera. I mean, you know, uh, some people jump off two feet to catch live. Some people jump off one, right? Mm. Some people only like shooting in the left corner or the right corner. So you have to learn all those nuances on the fly. And um, with that group, you know, we had a lot of shooting as well. So, you know, my, my task was to find them more so than, uh, you know, uh, scoring as much. That's yeah. why I was like, I think it was like nine assists, something like that with uh, the Nets. Versus probably like five with uh, Dallas. Yeah, it's a big jump. Yeah. And you guys made the playoffs. You ended the season pretty strong. What was it like yeah. in the playoffs? Um, I mean, it was tough. We we ran to Philly, who has, uh, you know, obviously a former MVP in Harden, but also the current MVP in Joel Embiid. Right. Um, you know, it's no real secret. We couldn't really guard him. So, <laughs> yeah, we were Harden doubling. Went off. Yeah, I mean, we were doubling Joel, and then we were in rotations. Harden ended up having a couple big games, and it was just uh, – it was it was tough. It was a very tough matchup for y'all. Yeah. You just yeah. did not match up extremely as much as you wanted. Probably yeah, too. exactly. Like anytime you have like doubling is something you do typically when um, you're in a bind, mm -hmm. right? Somebody gets cooking or whatever else. It's usually an adjustment. Um, in, in this situation, our game plan was to double essentially all the time, which is perfectly fine and fair because obviously we, we couldn't really guard Joel straight up. Right. Um, but when you do that, now. Tobias Harris, who's a very talented player, Tyrese Max, who's a very talented player, they're catching you on closeouts and in rotations and things like that, mm. which makes it immensely more difficult. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
even if we were playing, if I had to run full speed in one direction, you got to pick which way you're going to go. Mm. It's going to be harder for me to stop you because now I'm just guessing. Yeah. W- would you say there's certain players like MB that are just unguardable one-on-one? Um, I mean, I'm... <laughs> I don't think anybody yeah. is unguardable. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, I think it comes down to matchup, right? Like, if you have, uh, I don't know, man. Uh, but just another big enough body. I mean, maybe a Brooke Lopez or something. Yeah. You put up a, a different type of uh, resistance to that um, style of player, mm. right? And so a lot of that comes down to matchups. Yeah. Whereas, like, for example, Nick Claxton, our center, is probably the best uh, five man at switching in the league. Really? Like, oh, yeah. Like, he, he can switch out, guard a wing, et cetera, like, mm. with the best of them. Wow. So if we played a team that, you know, didn't necessarily have a, you know, I don't know how big Joel is, but let's say 275, maybe a 275 pound center. We probably would have been able to stick to switch and everything, um, which is a big strength of our team with like Mikhail and, you know, Dorian Finney Smith and Royce and, and Nick, um, and then kept everybody in front. And then that leads also to fueling our offense. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It helps us get uh, more pace and get on transition. Yeah. I don't want to get you in trouble, so I'm yeah. going to ask you a positive question. <laughs> Who's the most underrated player in the NBA right now? Mm. Most underrated? I was going to ask overrated, but I don't want to make any enemies. Overrated? Oh, yeah, no. Underrated? <laughs> um, uh, underrated that I'm a fan of? Like, maybe somebody who, who would like, oh, actually, if you could put somebody on your team who you think is underrated tomorrow? Oh, oh I mean, no, that's, 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 two, that's two different questions. Uh, but I would say somebody that I think got his flowers this year, more so than he has in the past, De'Aaron Fox. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And, and you mentioned the Kings, so maybe that's why it's on my mind. And but, I went to Kentucky. Oh well, hey. No, I think I think he got his flowers this year, but in general though, he's he's a really he's a really good player, and I don't think uh, prior to this season he kind of got his flowers just in terms of like the media and stuff. Yeah, do you think it's because he's from a smaller market team? I mean, smaller market. No, not really. <laughs> no, yeah, smaller market hadn't really won, and you know sometimes obviously, you know, you you get dinged for not winning, which yeah. is understandable, but it's not always like that player's fault either. Right. You know what I'm saying? So. You know, and I don't know the Sacramento dynamics or anything like that. I just, I'm a fan of uh, his game. I think he's really yeah. good. So you've been in the league for about 10 years now. Have you seen the game change at all from when you first got in? A ton. Really? Oh, a ton. When My, my first year, 2014, uh, our, our initial starting lineup was Brandon Jennings, Contavious Caldwell-Pope, mm. Josh Smith at the three, Greg Monroe at the four, mm. and Andre Drummond at the five. Those three players that I just named, right now would probably be all centers in today's NBA mm. just because of the shooting. Now, obviously, Josh Smith would be more like a stretch four. Yeah, stretch four. Like, free like, yeah, like Draymond Green. It's <laughs> yeah. like because he was actually really good in the DHO and like, uh, you know, passing game. I think he was really underrated in that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Greg Monroe is definitely a back to the basket center, like Jokic style. Mm-hmm. And Drummond is your typical lob threat center, like DeAndre Jordan style. So mm. we had three it had been like starting draymond green nikola Jokic, and deandre jordan <laughs> i can't wow. picture that would be crazy yeah so you've had to kind of change your game over the years to adapt to the yeah. the game for sure i mean that that's a that's a part of it um i would say for you know a guard the the transition has been a little bit more seamless mm. um because it's it's not like my position got kind of eliminated or something like that like the back to the basket fours they're they're gone now yeah um but I, I think the the premium on three point shooting is definitely a thing. Whereas like when I first got drafted, that was right before the Warriors kind of took off. I think mm. the Warriors kind of took off in like 15, 16. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so being in there in 2014, it was still before everybody was like, you got to be able to shoot not just threes, but from like deep. Right. Now you need to shoot or else yeah. you're a liability. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. Like even centers are shooting threes now. Oh, yeah. Sure. I mean, mid-range game has disappeared. Very few people yeah. are even allowed to take those shots anymore. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, DeMar DeRozan would be an example of someone who yeah. still gets the green light on that and stuff yeah. like that. But where is your favorite spot to mm. score from on the court? Mm. And I'm sure this is in all the scouting reports, so we're not giving any too much away. But like, <laughs> No, no, not at all. I mean, my, my whole game is based on uh, uh, breaking the paint, basically. Okay. Um, causing havoc in that manner, whether that be through isolations or pick and rolls. Um, so, I mean, the, the low hang fruit would probably be a layup. Yeah. You know I mean, just because like my job is literally getting the paint. Right. And then make the read off of that. So mm. I would just probably go with that one. And if not, then a step back. 
Yeah. Your step back's nasty. Thank you. I wish I had a step back. <laughs> <laughs> what age would you say most people are in their prime in the NBA? Oh, um, I would say it kind of depends on, are we looking for like a prime year or are we looking for like yeah, prime the windows? Years, like maybe oh, three year window? period. Yeah. Uh, probably like 28 to 32 mm. or so mm. would probably be like your, your peak. Um, in terms of athletically, at least. And then if you're good and with your body and stuff, and because your game's going to continue to evolve. I, you know, we see like LeBron, for example, and, and guys get more skilled heading into like near 40. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I would say your athletic peak is probably at 20 to 32. If you take care of your body, extend that to 35, 36, probably. Nice. So you're in your prime right now. Yeah, like dead smack in the middle. Of <laughs> you're feeling good right now? Oh, I feel great. So, yeah, I mean, you're talking about how much you take care of your body. What does yeah. your, you know, daily routine during the season look like to mm. take care of yourself, rest, recovery, all that? Because it's hard. You're in hotels. You're doing everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we have kind of like, I would say, three days in uh, during season. It's it's not Monday through right. Sunday, right? It's like uh, you got game day, you got practice day, and you got like light practice day, mm -hmm. right? Um you know, practice day, you could be in there an hour and a half, two hours, right, with the actual practice, but you're going to get there early. You probably got a hour and a half worth of lifting prior to that. You got some level of table work, so you're you're talking to the PT, uh, getting some level of adjustment, et cetera. So that probably takes 30 minutes. So you're looking at a two-hour block for that, two-hour block for practice. Afterwards, you probably got massage mm -hmm. or any other type of stretch routine. So let's put it hour, hour and a half for that. Then you talk about sauna, cold tub, um, things of that nature. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're not a nine to five, but you're probably like a nine to three. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Um, with no lunch break. <laughs> so, Man. man. Wow. Now you see a lot of these younger guys coming in the league getting injured and there's yeah. talk on social media that they're playing too many games in high school leading up to it. Like these tournaments yeah. are like five, 10 games a weekend. Do you yeah. think that's true? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not a, uh, you know, biomechanics expert, but I would say, I mean, you would think, right? Like, yeah. uh, we only have so much cartilage. We only have so much, you know, miles, et cetera. And if you wear it out, then, you know, you're not. And remember, the other thing, too, is we play 82 games. But again, what I just say, we're we're there nine to three, four, four of those hours are body focused. Mm. Right. Whereas only two of them are like basketball focus for real right. so we're we're and we're gonna have a different style of diet we're gonna just just the investment to our body is gonna be a completely different thing mm. with a kid you know they're gonna eat mcdonald's between the <laughs> yeah you feel me like and not saying that's bad like you're a kid like go for it you know what i'm saying i don't want you to be like you know super strict at 12 years old and hate your life yeah. um but all that contributes to breakdown yeah, I feel like they don't teach the diet aspect when you're a kid. Like in high school, I ate terrible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's getting more famous now, all the health and wellness movement and yeah. stuff like that. And so what was your welcome to the NBA moment? Mm. Welcome to the NBA moment. When you were like, holy <laughs> shit, these guys are good. <laughs> I'm here. Um, I mean, probably just in practice. Um, Brandon Jennings was somebody I looked up to, mm -hmm. um, being from L.A. Yeah. Um, and then... Going into uh, Detroit, obviously coming off injury and having to guard him and stuff in practice. And, you know, people forget he was probably on pace to have an all-star year um, before he uh, tore his Achilles. Mm. So, like, he was he was in prime form. He was hooping. And, obviously, there was that balance of, like, you know, a guy that I looked up to because he was, like, a senior in high school when I was, like, going into high school. Yeah. You know what I mean? And McDonald's All-American the whole nine. One of the probably best uh, high school guys that – we've had in America, you know what I'm saying? Which is why he got to go overseas. Mm. Uh, so I would say my, my welcome to NBA moment was probably just, you know, having to compete against him in practice. Cause again, like I didn't, I ain't play that much. Like, so but. when people were like, you know, who busted his rookie year was like, honestly guys, I didn't really play. <laughs> so, so nobody did, but this isn't being cocky. This is literally like, I wasn't on the floor to even get my ass busted. Yeah. You know? Now you've played for a lot of different coaches. I've seen Shaq, Shaq's take on coaches. He said, they don't matter. What's your take on coaches? Nah, they, they matter. It's just that it's different than it is in uh, high school, college, et cetera. It has far less to do with, like, X's and O's. You know what I'm saying? It's more about, like, uh, managing personalities. You know what I'm saying? Managing egos. It, mm. it's, you're almost like a professional psychologist at that 
uh, state. Because like I said, most NBA actions, like we may run a, a ton of misdirection. We may have pin downs over here and screens over there and mm -hmm. all the other stuff. Nine times out of 10, when it breaks down, it gets to a pick and roll in isolation. Mm. That's where it like, and we'll do a whole bunch of other stuff. We'll run over <laughs> here and run over there. And this guy will scream for that guy and whatever, but then you'll get it to one of your best players and he'll do one of those two things. Right. So that's why I think a lot of guys say it's less so about the coaching um, in terms of the X and O's. But nah, you still got to be there and, and, and be a psychologist and, and create chemistry and culture. And, mm. you know, that's supremely important. I right. think part of the reason we were able to have the, the, the run in Dallas when we went to the conference finals was just purely down to chemistry and culture because you wouldn't look at that team and think that we were the most talented in the world. Mm. Coaching's a tough job, man. They don't last long. Mm. Nah, and you see they get all them grays and stuff. Yeah. They get stressed, man. I think I, three of the last four coach of the years have been fired. I saw that. That's that was tough. crazy. I'm like, don't win that award. That's tough. Hey, man. Hey, you got to remember, like, you, the owner can't fire himself, right? right? And then – the max player probably ain't gonna get fired neither. So like, yeah. and the GM's gonna point to the coach before he points to himself. Well, I mean, you got the, the only two are left are GM or coach. You gotta <laughs> pick one. Like, just, I'm just being real. Yeah. Like, you know, LeBron ain't getting fired, and the owner not firing himself. So that means the only two people you could point at are either GM or coach. And, yeah, you know, I, I'd say it's probably kind of unfortunate in that respect. It makes their job a lot harder for sure. Was you, was Stan the coach when you got to Detroit still? And Gundy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why it's hard cracking the yeah. rotation because oh, he yeah. loves vets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, That's yeah. tough. Do you think a lot of coaches don't get respect from the players? Um, I think in any situation, just because of how I kind of like name that pegging order in terms of like, you know, owner, max player, then we kind of get into the uh, – and that's if you have a true max guy. Like some teams don't. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm literally talking about the LeBron Giannis of the world, right? Um, as long as the – the top guys respect the coach, then the coach has the respect. Mm. It's just that, like, you can have that fracture in the locker room if, like, just like anything else, right? These people over here and then these people over there and then, you know, that's over there. And then then it becomes hard for the young guys to follow, right? Because, right. oh, I'm a rookie. Do I, you know, listen to LeBron? Do I listen to the, the coach? Do I listen to GM? It, 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 as long as everybody's on the same page, and, again, this goes with, anything you know what i'm saying in life any organization any you know group whatever like if you have a kind of a confirmed direction everybody's on the same page then everybody follows and everybody gets the requisite respect yeah that makes sense what's on your nba checklist what are you trying to accomplish before you retire oh easy one would be championship i was, gonna, I was yeah. gonna just point to the yeah do the lsu point to the ring yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. easy one's championship yeah you know i mean like uh i think uh, especially for a guy uh in in my position and and to your point of how, how I approach the game, how I play the game, and then um, just understanding, like, how individual awards are won, like, it would definitely be a championship. Hmm. Have you made an all-star game yet? No. No, I haven't. There's an argument to be made that I should have, but <laughs> I have not. You definitely should have. The 21-point-a-game season? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. I Thank wonder you. who got in over him. What do you think has been – because there's been an overriding theme, right? Like you, Like you said – High school, your junior year, I think you averaged seven points a game yeah. and like five assists, yeah. right? Senior year, 11.2 and like seven assists. Yeah. But you're talking about how you're on a stack team. Yeah. You go to Boulder. I don't know how your, your freshman year went, but I think sophomore year you made Pac-12, all Pac-12 yeah, yeah. stuff like that. But then you tear your ACL. Yeah. You go to the league. You're fighting. You're in Grand Rapids. Yeah. You know, injuries are happening. You've seized every opportunity, and it's been so important for you because you've been doubted until that opportunity came, yeah. and then you kick it out of it. Yeah. What do you think it is about? I don't know. I don't want to call it clutch, but you just seem to show up when it's time to show up. Is there something yeah. that you think gets you going internally when it's like this is my time? If I don't do it now, I might not get it again. Mm. Um, I think when I was younger, there was some of that like back against the wall feeling for sure. Um, as you're in the G League and things like that. I think um, like the, the resoluteness comes from like uh, just the work, you know, I think um, my parents instilled a, a work ethic in me. My uncle has done a great job, you know what I'm saying, training me. And I feel like I've worked harder than everybody or most people. And, you know, w when you've done that, you just don't really have regrets. So you live and die with whatever happens. Like I, I genuinely, again, to your point, like I feel like I'm trying to make the best decision possible. Like. I'm not out there just shooting for the of it, right? Like, if I shot it, it's because I thought that was the best shot at the time. If I passed it, it's because I thought it was the best pass at the time. Mm. And so 
I don't live with very many regrets. And I think that's why I'm able to kind of do that. And I understand, like, I'm going to shoot this shot. And if I miss it, 20,000 people are mad. If I make it, 20,000 people are happy. And <laughs> you you got to it gotta is what it is. Yep. Yeah, you yeah. got to move forward. Did the haters get to you at first, though, on social media? Because they'd be ruthless. Um, Yeah, I mean, there were, there were time periods, like, it would, it would bother me. I think, um, you know, as you get older, as you mature, things like that, um, a lot of times people that are that mad on the Internet are only doing that because, like, something's going on with their lives. Mm. You know what I mean? And it's not to necessarily even say their lives suck or anything, because I'm not taking this like, oh, my life is great approach or whatever. But literally, like, if, if I'm angry, right, if I'm pissed off at my job or whatever happens, and then, you know, the one piece of peace that I get is the Nets winning a basketball game. And I feel like Spencer stole that piece from me, and I'm already angry at my job. Yeah, mm. like, now I'm mad at him. And, you know, it, it's it's not – even at that point, really a personal attack because you don't know me. Right. You know what I'm saying? And again, I wasn't trying to mess up. It happens. Yeah. Um, and so when you take it in that light, um, you don't, it doesn't get to you, you don't really get mad. And then the funny part is, most of the time when you're greeted with that type of energy and you're like, hey, look, bro, chill out, they turn right back into like fans. Like, <laughs> immediately just like, oh man, like I was just mad. Like it wasn't like that. Much respect, much love. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you know, much of it's all good. So you got a burner account? No, no. <laughs> honestly, honestly, I, I, I don't have a Facebook app on my phone. I don't have a Twitter app on my phone. Uh, I'm not on threads. Like I'm just on Instagram a little bit. Okay. Um, well, a medium a bit. I'm not even, I'm not going to say a little bit, like a medium amount, but that's really it. I do mostly collab post basketball stuff, but yeah, that's, a, that's really it. <laughs> I saw, um, you're into cryptocurrency. Uh huh. How do you invest all the money you're making now? Do you have a plan? future business in mind um yeah no i mean i think um the the life cycle of investment strategies is, is kind of like uh y'all ever seen those target funds with like vanguard or something like that where yep. it's like you you target it out to like 2060 or something like that and it starts out with a bunch of stocks and then go with the bonds and things like that yeah i think um you know i've been fortunate to do some vc stuff you know have a couple hits uh you know, building a company, um, Calaxy, done some cryptocurrency stuff. And, you know, now in my uh, life cycle of investing, I'm looking into like multifamily real estate and getting into that. Mm. And so I guess this would kind of be my uh, bonds era of- uh, Playing it safer. Yeah, bonds era of investing. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate, you know what I'm saying? Companies like Lemon Perfect and Genies and, yeah. you know, being in the like seed rounds and stuff like that is- Crushing like, it. Yeah, no, like, no, you have misses too. Don't get me wrong. Like, <laughs> you have you have misses, but um, I, I've had some some hits that have that have been pretty fortunate. Yeah. Does it worry you that like eighty percent of athletes go broke? Does it worry me? Yeah. Personally, or like just in general? Like when you were coming into the league, was that a thought or not? No, nah, not really. Um, because you got to remember, like the when I was first in the league, I wasn't really making no money. Right. So like, I was like, man. I, I shouldn't even be in this statistic. Yeah. Then obviously once I broke through and, uh, you know, kind of started hitting the contracts and then everything is like set up the way it is and the TV money's going up and, mm -hmm. you know, now everybody's getting a hundred million dollars. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And it's only go going higher. Right. Like we're supposed to get more TV money, I think in 2025. Wow. Yeah. So like when everybody was like, oh man, how, you know, this guy get 80, this guy get a hundred this summer. Well, you got to remember the, 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 the cap goes, up next year yep. it goes up again the year after and it's mm. gonna apparently balloon after that damn you know what and i'm then, saying and now they have the minimums yeah like the minimums are higher i mean like i said when i came to the league the minimum was like five hundred thousand. now it's like 1.3 well, even the, 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 the team has a minimum oh now. that's so right they the have, so like, oh, really? the spurs had to sign somebody just to get over the team salary cap yeah. minimum Whoa. that's how little yeah. they were spending yeah wow so it's, so it's like a it's a whole new world out there. Yeah. Like a hundred million is getting thrown out. Like, and you're at your peak right now, so you're good timing. I, I mean, well, yeah. I mean, I hope, I hope, uh, you know, to stay on the nets uh, yeah. long term and you know not have to, you know, go through any of that. But you know, if it does happen, obviously, like, yeah, it's just, it's just the market. I mean, so you know, a hundred million in terms of real life, that's a boatload of money, right? Yeah. But everything has to be done to your point with percentages of cap, right? Mm. So it's like the team has to spend 90% or they have to spend, let's say it's $150 million any given year, right? Mm -hmm. And then 
this guy is my starter, so he has to get 18% of said cap. Mm. So it's a slot. You know what I mean? Got it. Yeah, so it's not like, man, $100 million is a lot in real life. Spencer didn't get that. Well, if Spencer's getting the slot for a starting point guard, then he has to get this amount of money. For yeah. a basketball yeah, team for that's a worth basketball $4 team billion. That's worth, yeah, like it's just <laughs> the, the slots dictate what it is. And, you know, the TV money has a huge effect on that. Yeah. I saw a Gilbert Arenas thing recently where he said, obviously you have a, you know, you have bonuses structured and if you yeah. get certain points per game, stuff like yeah. that. He said on uh, shitty teams yeah. that they purposely will try their best to make sure that you don't hit some of those bonuses. Do you think that's true? Oh, uh, I've never been in that situation. Okay. Maybe back in the day. Yeah. I've, I've never, I've never been in that situation. Yeah. Gil was talking about how like, you know, if you're at nine, if you're at like 19.9, and they're going in the last game of the year, and you get like a mil bonus for hitting twenty. Like they, they, they ain't playing you that game. Oh, I'd be pissed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd be hot. Yeah. I saw in the Miami Heat, you got to have a certain body fat percentage. Have you heard of that? Eight yeah. or I think it's eight, eight or less. That's crazy. Yeah. Does I've every team do that. that? Or no, no. Wow. But the Heat are definitely. Uh, I mean, I don't say notorious because that could have a negative connotation. But you just hear the stories about <clears throat> how dedicated they are to like fitness conditioning. Like, yeah. like team wide, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, but at the end of the day though, they're in the finals like every other year. Yeah. So yeah, I saw that stuff. So I, I said like, I saw something like Pat Riley's been involved in almost half of every NBA finals that has ever existed as either a player coach or executive. You serious? That's yeah. Amazing. It was like, it was like literally like, but like, it was like literally like a third or half of every NBA finals that has ever existed. Pat Jeez. Riley has been involved in one of those three. That's ways. Man, yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, he, he's a goat for that. So yeah. you're mentioning like different training staffs, Miami and stuff. Mm. Phoenix is, you know, famous for having all the, you know, stretching the ligaments and stuff like yeah. that. What has been the most ridiculous training or physical thing that anyone's ever asked you to do as an NBA <laughs> athlete? Like, like go, I don't know, do a handstand underwater for 30 minutes or go, we're going to stretch all your hamstring, you know, just weird stuff that we would <laughs> never stuff? think about. Uh, nah, I, I haven't. I've witnessed the water workouts okay. that um, I guess would be weirder or tougher, you know what I'm saying? But I've never really uh, been in any of those. I think um, I've been blessed to have a phenomenal trainer. Um, shout out Mike G, Mr. Do It Moving on uh, Instagram. Um, yeah, it's all it's all like a, applied movement uh, style lifting and, and conditioning and stuff. So um, I've been really fortunate to have him in, in my corner. Love that. Right. Spencer, what's next for you, man? And what are you working on? What's next for me? Um, well, I mean, I said in, in terms of investing multifamily, but honestly, like when it's all said and done, I, I really enjoy being a dad and I really enjoy uh, cooking in my spare time. So mm. I, I'm, I'm I'm pretty chill. Like when it's all said and done, like I'm going to be relaxing for, for a minute. Okay. You're yeah. going to drop some food company or something? Maybe. You know <laughs> or a cookbook or something. I mean, maybe put together family recipes. I don't know. All but. Right. Some creative, uh, feed my mind a little bit, but but chill at least for the first couple of years, probably. Hell yeah! Well, thanks for coming on, man. It was a blast. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.